Hey there, thanks for tuning in to today's discussion on how to find customers for your farm business. My name is Carolyn Katsarubis. I am the Director of Marketing and Community Relations here at Freight Farms, and I am joined by my colleague, Rick. Rick, can you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Rick Trenchard. I'm the Director of Sales here at Freight Farms. Great. So we have a lot of things to discuss today. Uh, we are going to briefly touch upon the three big things that you need in order to get your container farming business off the ground. Then popular distribution channels our farmers choose to sell, uh, to sell through. And then knowing your value proposition of the product um, that you're trying to sell uh, in order to sell effectively. And then we're gonna go into strategies for each of these channels from restaurants and grocery stores to farmers markets and CSAs. There will be a live Q&A at the end of this webinar, but we have people that are um, on the other line that are able to answer your questions as they come up. So feel free to plug those into your panel um, on the webinar uh, control panel. And this whole session will be recorded uh, for your viewing after the fact. Great. So, Rick, you talk to prospective clients every day and know some of the most important things uh, that someone needs to get started. Can you walk us through those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's three things you need to figure out before starting your, your project with us. Uh, one is financing. A lot of our farmers go through farm credit or USDA or through their local bank. We actually have pro forma financial tools that will help you forecast the economics of, the, of your business, and this could improve your chances of getting a loan. The next thing you need to figure out is getting a site approved. Um, obviously, you need a space big enough to put a 40-foot container. Um, we also suggest placing it on a hard surface like concrete or railroad ties and have access to water and electricity in order to hook it up. Um, and the last thing was, as far as the site goes is abide by local zoning laws. Um, typically, our farmers install the greenery in commercial or industrial zones. And last but not least is finding customers, which is what this webinar is about. Um, we'll spend the next few minutes talking about different customer segments that we've seen success in. Great. So when choosing to start your container farming business, in addition to successfully operating your farm, you need to develop reliable, a reliable client base if you want to have a prosperous business. So we are going to talk about four distribution channels that our farmers most frequently sell into, each having their benefits and trade-offs, uh, which we'll go into. So we categorize these from in business to business, B2B, and that's restaurant and grocery sales, and then business to consumer, B2C, uh, and that's farmers markets and CSAs. So before, um, before you start looking for customers, it's fundamental to understand the value of your produce and brand. So when you go to pitch, you should be as fluent as possible in what your value proposition is. So let's run through the top six value props for produce grown in a container farm. The first one to look to consider is the local aspect of your product. Most states categorize local as 500 miles from, from farm to table, while most of our customers are within 10 miles from their, their end consumer. So you're, you're hyper local, and that tends to demand a higher premium when it comes to pricing. Um, the, next, the next thing to look at is the year round availability of the farm. Uh, because the greenery is climate controlled and set to the most ideal growing conditions for your crop, you will be able to harvest year round regardless of the season. This allows you to price your crop at a flat rate instead of the typical volatile pricing we see in the produce industry. Uh, not to mention, depending on your location, this serves as a competitive advantage in that not many local farmers are able to grow leafy greens during the winter months. Um, and so that's something to consider as well. Awesome. And the third one is the food safe aspect of produce grown in the greenery. A lot of our farmers choose not to grow with any pesticides or herbicides. Um, and it's a, a, a way to always offer your community clean and safe produce in the event of uh, an outbreak. You know, we've been experiencing a significant uptick in um, E. coli outbreaks. A lot of our farmers do, do very well during um, those time periods uh, or other situations where food supply is compromised. They're able to relay that trust and transparency onto the end consumer. And on top of that, the produce grown inside the farm is
or the next day. So when people are actually consuming it, it's a lot closer to when it was harvested, a lot more fresh and uh, nutritionally dense. And on top of that, there's a lot less waste um, than you would traditionally find in uh, the supply chain. Uh, another thing to consider is the uniqueness of your product. Um, there's over 3,000 varieties of produce that can be grown in the greenery, and a lot of it cannot be sourced by local distributor or, or, or wholesale markets. Um, for instance, specialty herbs like sorrel or leafy greens like wasabi arugula are popular amongst chefs but are difficult to source in the wholesale market. Awesome. And, you know, one of the most popular value props for, for the produce dr grown in the greenery is definitely that it's sustainable. Um, on top of reducing food miles by growing locally and not using herbicides or pesticides, this way of growing is incredibly water efficient, using only about 99.8% less water than conventional farms. All right, now let's jump into the first segment that we're going to be talking about restaurants. This is historically a very successful channel for our customers. So Rick, tell us how to find customers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you want to target restaurants that value quality um, specialty crops or, or, or local farmers. Uh, the best place to start is places that you either frequent off, often or you have existing relationships with. Um, other than that, you want to maybe approach farmer's market. A lot of chefs that value quality produce will source their, their, their produce from farmer's market. And last but not least, if you have your farm on site, throw an event, have a party, have, have some of the chefs in your local community come over. Great. Now, when it comes to, to making your pitch, um, you know, we went over a few of the value propositions. But one thing that we've learned over over the years is that you want to go in in a non-peak hour, right? Ideally, between two and four p.m. when the restaurant is prepping for dinner, you know, you knock on the back and you ask the chef if they have ten minutes to talk to a local farmer. Um, chances are, most chefs love talking um, to local farmers and they want to know where the produce is coming from, and you want to go there with confidence. Um, you're you're in there and you're selling something that they absolutely want. Um, the best thing you want to do is is understand their supply chain needs, what crops they're looking for, and you know if you don't have the farm yet, come prepared with a with a crop guide of what can grow in the greenery. Um, a better instance is if you actually have the product to present to them and have them taste on the spot. That's usually the best way to go about it. Great, and you can see in in the picture on the right, this is just an example of one of the samples um, our farmers was were bringing to to local chefs to get their attention. Okay, so let's talk about the business impacts of selling to this particular channel, and we'll go through each segment um, as we cover them. So from an operational consideration, uh, this definitely requires lower packaging and distribution costs compared to the other channels that we'll be talking about. And that allows you to keep your business a little bit more lean. And you can reuse, uh, you can use reusable bulk packaging, which will reduce costs significantly. You will also probably be making deliveries one to two times per week per restaurant, usually first thing in the morning. So the operational portion of your work won't be too much. Absolutely. Um, and the next thing to, to also keep in mind is that you, a lot of times chefs will pay a premium or pay more than what they typically pay for in wholesale if they like the quality and the consistency of your produce. So keep that in mind when you're pricing your crops. And the next thing to, to consider is the stability of the price. I, I mentioned this earlier, you can, you can help them avoid seasonal price fluctuations by providing consistent quality and quantity at one price point year round. Great. And if you're looking to learn a little bit more about um, how our farmers do this, we have a great customer example, Hammock Greens in Miami, Florida. They operate about six farms in the area and sell to local restaurants. We have an entire case study and webinar on this team, um, and it's linked somewhere in your webinar uh, handout. So feel free to watch that after. All right. Next uh, channel in the B2B segment, Rick, grocery stores. Yeah, grocery stores. There's there's many different ones you can target. Um, you can look at specialty ones like Whole Foods or the the small mom and pop ones. You can go to big chains like um, Stop and Shop or Publix. Um, but the first thing you want to do is is understand if they if they are selling um, higher price point produce. Um, lucky for you, this is a time where a lot of grocery stores have 
little sections in the produce sec produce department where they're focusing on local and hydroponic produce and you can see heads of lettuce selling for four dollars for four fifty a head um, so best way to find customers is, is first looking at the, at the research and seeing which ones are offering this type of product and the next thing you want to do is is talk to the produce manager um, same way you would approach a chef go in a non-busy time of day and know what your value propositions are. Those produce managers are incentivized to grow revenue for that department, and you're offering them a value, valuable product. So the conversation should go pretty smoothly. And say you do get a grocery account that you're selling into, you should keep in mind that you're not getting much face-to-face -face time with the actual end consumer because you are working with the middleman. So you want to find ways to actually get in front of the end consumer. A lot of the times today, uh, grocery stores will allow um, you know, small producers or local farmers to set up tables and give out samples and get some face-to-face -face time with the end consumer. So definitely look for opportunities where you can uh, kind of get in front of uh, the person. And with this channel in particular, you definitely want to invest in uh, good packaging and labeling and branding that will articulate your value. Um, so maybe walk around your local grocery store, put your consumer hat on, take notes on what type of packaging appeals to you, and, and then try and emulate that when it comes to building your own brand. And you, know, when you're making that pitch to the produce manager, um, same way you would talk to a chef, understand their supply chain issues, where they're sourcing their produce, uh, mention that you're able to offer your product year round and there'll, there'll never be a shortage of it. Um, and also understand that your product typically has a longer shelf life, which is very appealing to a product, uh, the produce manager meaning less waste for the store, um, happier customers. And the next thing you wanted to illustrate for them is the food safety aspect. Um, we, a lot of our greeneries, customers who are selling into the grocery store go through a GAP certification, which is good agriculture practice. And, and they pass with flying colors because there's, there's no pesticides used in the farm. Um, it's, it's, re it's very clean. Um, and this is a big value add for, for uh, grocery stores. Great. Now let's chat about the business impact. Um, this channel definitely requires more careful packaging, labeling, and branding. Unlike the other few channels that we're going to be discussing, discussing, like I mentioned, you're not going to get that face-to-face -face time with the final consumer as often as you would like. So that means you really have to justify your, your likely higher price points with the information on your label. Additionally, grocery stores can have stricter regulations around packaging, usually requiring plastic clamshells, which can be a little bit more expensive. Um, and this channel also can have a little bit of red tape. Uh, typically, all grocery stores need, um, grocery store suppliers need to get GAP certification like Rick mentioned, and hydroponic farmers have no problem getting certified, but it can be a lengthy um, bureaucratic process. Yeah. And when it comes to pricing your crops in this segment, one thing I would definitely keep in mind is that there's multiple middlemen that tend to be involved when, when selling into this space. Um, if you're lucky, I would recommend selling directly to the grocery store. However, a lot of times they, they, want, to, they want you to go through a wholesaler or a distributor, and that just adds more cost in, in selling into the segment. Um, so definitely consider that. And the next thing which is the advantage for everybody, is there is a demand for local and hydroponic produce inside of grocery stores. So you shouldn't have an issue um, selling into the segment and, and retaining customers. Great. And here is another customer example, Enlightened Crops in the Grand Rapids, Michigan. We have an entire webinar and case study on Steve Huntley and his wife. Um, they choose to sell to uh, a local grocery store and they have a great story to tell Again, definitely encourage you to listen to that if this is a channel that you're looking to sell into. Uh, before we go on to farmers markets, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions that are coming up as we're having this discussion, plug them into the control panel um, through the webinar panel, and we'll get to them in the live Q&A section. All right, so now we're shifting to B2C. Um, this is business to consumer, and you're going um, we're going to split them up between farmers markets and CSA. So first, farmers markets, they're a great option, um, especially for warmer weather locations where you can expect markets to be open year round. And it's a great place to, to have that face to face interaction with the end consumer. And this client base is self-selecting. 
people visiting farmers markets are already on the market for local and artisanal goods, which is really great for you. And this is um, a fantastic way to establish yourself in your community as a new farmer. And oftentimes farmers markets help our farmers find customers in other channels, kind of like what we said with restaurants, a lot of chefs tend to um, attend farmers markets looking for, for new vendors to work with. Um, and then it'll also be a great way to potentially start a CSA, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So first, you need to find the right farmer's market for you and hopefully one that's uh, local and close to you and ideally that operates year round, especially if this is the main channel that you're gonna be selling through. And then talk to the manager about becoming a vendor and what you need to get set up. Um, when you actually become a vendor, uh, there are a lot of opportunities that you should be taking advantage of um, to attract people to your booth. Maybe like a small giveaway, giving um, that encourages people to stop by your, your table and use this as an opportunity to introduce yourself and get them to sample some of the produce. Definitely encourage you to give out flyers and business cards to all your customers. You never know who will be a referral or who's gonna stop by your booth. And if you have social media or a website where you're promoting your business, definitely announce your locations uh, so your followers know when and where to come see you. Now, with this, uh, making your pitch at a farmer's market is interesting because your product is local and fresh, but likely is, so is the product from the other vendors because um, typically it's local farmers and producers. So you should really try and distinguish yourself on the hydroponic element and how uh, this enables you to grow in a completely safe environment year round. And do your research on um, the crops that you should be growing. So maybe before you even start as um, a, a vendor, walk around the farmer's markets, take notes on who, uh, who grows what, and maybe tailor what you're growing specifically to avoid competition. Uh, and then you have to think about your display. This should be something colorful, attention grabbing, and gives off the feeling of abundance, like overflowing produce. Now, there are a lot of uh, kind of operational considerations that you should take, um, you should you should think about before using uh, this channel as your distribution uh, market. So costs for joining can be high, especially for new farmers, um, and you do need to invest in certain types of packaging, labeling, and booth setup so that you're attracting the customers. And I would say the biggest uh, operational consideration would be that you're often working on the weekends um, and long hours at, uh, for that matter. Uh, so you just wanna think about that when you're, when you're trying to plan out what type of lifestyle you would like to have um, when being a farmer. Yeah, and I'll also add to that, that you know, what you're, what you're gaining from working on the weekends and those extra hours is higher price points. Um, there's no middleman, you're selling directly to the consumer. Another thing that I'll be weary of is uh, excess inventory. The last thing you want is to harvest a full farm's worth of produce and have it rain on a Saturday. Um, there goes your inventory. So always have a backup plan, whether it's a restaurant or, you know, a CSA program that we're gonna talk to in a bit in case something like that does happen. Great. Uh, just a quick customer example. This is OD Greens in Ohio. Uh, you can just tell right off the bat, this is a booth that is very abundant in produce and it's just very eye-catching. Um, and you can see his banner behind him says locally grown hydroponic produce. So really touching upon all of those value points. And then he also markets that he, this is veteran owned and operated and that is particular to his business and will attract a certain type of clientele. So you definitely want to make sure that your, your messaging is coming out in your, in your marketing. Uh, he also gives away t-shirts and other types of branded goods. All right, on to the last channel that we're going to be talking about, and that is CSA. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. This essentially means that customers get individual predetermined boxes of produce from you every single week, and they pick it up at a designated location. Um, this is a great sustainable business plan. You do get paid up front and always know how much you need to harvest so you won't have any wasted product. And you can set your own schedule for the most part, which can be attractive to people who are looking uh, to start farming to get out of that nine to five rut. So how do you find customers? 
I definitely recommend, and this comes from a lot of our farmers that also operate CSAs, uh, start with family, friends, neighbors, and existing communities that you're a part of. Um, that look at businesses that have customers that look similar to your ideal CSA member. For example, maybe people that visit a local craft brewery are in the market for local artisanal products or people that belong to a nearby yoga studio care about their health and wellness, maybe hang up flyers and have a website where they can uh, learn more about the CSA program. Then also create referral programs for existing customers. This is a great way to retain existing clientele and expand membership. Um, and then kind of like we mentioned earlier, join a farmer's market and add your repeat customers into your CSA program. This is a great option, especially if you're living in a seasonal environment and that farmer's market does not operate year round. So let's talk about your pitch. Uh, the biggest draw of the CSA that you're gonna be running is that you can provide access to local food year round. The traditional CSA typically only operates in the summer and a bit into the fall, um, so you can stand out by offering it year round. Another huge perk is that your customers will actually know what they're getting beforehand, so you can show them uh, a pre-planned schedule. You'll be getting a certain amount of lettuces, leafy greens, herbs every single week. And also you can collect feedback from your customers and adjust uh, what you're growing based on their, their taste. So that's a, a great feedback loop for your business and is attractive to customers because they'll have a little bit of say in what they're getting every week. Um, and then it's a, you can maybe frame it to be less of a, a commitment than the traditional CSA. Um, maybe an eight week cycle and then run that a particular amount of times uh, every year. So the business impact of, of this channel, um, it definitely consists of many operational requirements. There's packaging for individual shares and then also organizing your distribution channels. Uh, one good distribution option is to have um, the pickup be at your farm if it's in a convenient place or partner with other local businesses to have their locations be pickup points, whether that's cafes or gyms. This is a win-win for everyone. Customers can find a spot that's most convenient for them. And then the partner that you're working with gets foot traffic in their store and you don't have to worry about complicated distribution routes. Um, CSAs do require a bit more Technical components, uh, customers need to be able to sign up and pay online. So it's important that you have a compatible website. Yeah, and with regards to pricing, what we see a lot is customers have a pay upfront option. Um, this is good for a couple of reasons. One, it reduces the churn rate of people who are signed up to your service. And also you have all that money upfront to cover your expenses going forward, which is really valuable. Um, the next thing, similar to farmer's market, is that there's no middlemen. It's, it's just you and the client. Um, the real cost here is just the packaging side of things, um, but your margins should be pretty good in the segment. Great. A great customer example for selling um, into the CSA channel is Oasis Springs Farm in Nashville, New Hampshire. Uh, Sarah Ward and her husband um, have scaled their CSA program to the point where they have wait lists every single cycle. And we have an entire webinar where she shares her tips and tricks on how to get a CSA started. So definitely recommend um, viewing that if this is of interest to you. All right, you may be wondering, do I need to just pick one uh, channel to sell into? And the simple answer is no. Many of our customers have a multi-pronged approach, which helps them move all of their produce every week. And that type of diversification can also protect you if your business um, happens to take a hit if you lose a certain customer or channel. Uh, so on top of that, showing that diverse strategy will also make your business case stronger if you're applying for financing. So definitely start wide. Uh, follow ev every avenue that um, kind of comes up as an opportunity and then make decisions about narrowing in on a focus after you feel a little bit more established. You'll be able to see um, which path, path is best for you after a few months of operations. All right, Rick, the most common question, how do you find customers before your farm is delivered? 
That is a great question and one we get all the time. It's, it's very important to know who you're going to sell to before purchasing, um, especially if you're going through financing. Um, for this, we recommend approaching one or two good customer leads in the segments we just mentioned and getting them to sign a letter of intent. Um, this is unbinding for, for both parties, but it shows your bank that you're building a business case based on solid ground. And when you don't have the product in hand, the produce, what we recommend is, is printing out our, our crop list, our crop guide. It's just a list of all the crops that grow well on our farm. Go to a chef, go to a farmer's market and ask people, what can they not get year round? What's something that they really value on that list? And then try to get a deal done that way. Um, now, if you do have your farm, it's a lot easier to get uh, buyer agreements because you actually have the product in hand. But what we recommend is not to grow the full farm first, maybe do one third of the farm. Um, this is to avoid any uh, unnecessary expenses on your end, but but grow a wide variety, grow some some lettuces, some leafy greens, some herbs, and then you have uh, all, all these different products that you can showcase to potential buyers. Great. Uh, so we've been getting a lovely amount of questions from the audience. So if you have any more, please just submit them in the panel and we will try to get to them. Um, Rick, are you ready? Yes. Right. What um, One of the most popular ones would be, what resources uh, do we provide to help someone get started building their business plan? Yeah, I think the, the first two things I would do um, is try to identify what segment you feel more comfortable in um, and, and have that initial conversation before your farm arrives. So think about pricing, think about logistics, think about what seeds you need. Um, I would start there for identifying the segments. And the second thing I'll do is download our, our pro forma financial tool. It just breaks down your, your operating costs. Um, if you're gonna have labor, what your electricity rates are, um, it breaks down everything to understand what your margins are gonna look like. Great. Uh, is it possible for potential farmers to talk to existing farmers about their businesses? Absolutely. Um, just contact somebody on the business development team and we'll, we'll try to put you in touch with somebody. Um, keep in mind, a lot all of our farmers are private entities, so that they're busy running their business. Um, it's outside their own time uh, to dedicate to potential leads. It's very much a community aspect of why they're doing that. Um, but just be, you know, understanding of their time. Great. Um, this is a, a good one. Which are the best crops to grow for each segment? Uh, I think just an easy answer would be to create a dialogue with your customers. Uh, this makes them feel heard and takes out a lot of the guesswork. So just go to them directly and say, what would you like to be buying? Um, and, and start, I think, also with what you know will grow very well inside of the freight farm. And we have an entire list of recommended crops. Uh, for something like grocery, it might be harder to be priced price competitive on basic lettuces, so maybe target specialty and seasonal options like herbs. And then for CSA, it tends to be the opposite since people want to receive items they know how to use and can use every single day. So they might want to actually go with more of the basics like lettuces um, and kale and then maybe like a, an herb like basil. Uh, and then restaurants, again, it can vary, but very high quality basics are a great way to get in the door. Um, all right, what else do we go? Let's see, do farmers get certified organic? They, they do, it depends on your location. We do have farmers um, in the US who have successfully gotten organically certified, but I think it depends on a state-by-state -state basis. Typically what they look for is, are you, does your nutrients have organic material inside? And in that case, you can easily source organic nutrients. And that sometimes that's all it takes to get organically certified. Yeah, and we actually have um, a great webinar on the plant sciences behind operating in the greenery. If you wanted to listen to that, where we talk to our, our client services director, Dave, and we actually talk about um, getting certified organic but we actually hear from a lot of our customers that they choose not to go down the organic route because it can be a lengthy process and actually cost um, cost a bit of money. So it's a little 
uh, it's a little bit prohibitive for some. So that's where leaning on the the local aspect of the the marketing um, can actually be, be very appealing for for your end consumer. So think about how it's organic equivalent, even if it's not necessarily organic organically certified. All right. Do you use different packaging depending on the channel you are targeting? I would say yes, definitely. Um, each one has different different uh, packaging requirements. Probably the most packaging intensive channel would be the grocery channel uh, because they actually have regulations and requirements of around what type of packaging you should be using. Oftentimes it's um, plastic clamshells, which can definitely command a higher price and that will impact your business, um, the business side of things. So you definitely want to do more research into, into what packaging is required in each channel. All right, we are actually out of time, um, but like we mentioned, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our website and we'll be able to follow up specifically on any questions that were left unanswered. But thanks for tuning in and thanks for talking today, Rick. Thank you, everybody.